Well, John uh, approached me back in June, I think, uh, and asked if I'd be willing to uh, uh, offer a message uh, sometime in the fall. He was um, looking ahead to the, uh, the baby leave that J uh, Jana and Jeremy were going to be on, and he himself, of course, was going to be on a, a vacation at the same time. So he asked me if I would do that. Well, I went home that day and picked my topic. Then in September, John announced that we were doing a sermon series on um, conversations with Jesus. Well, at first, uh, I mean, I, my text is from the Old Testament. So uh, I said, well, um, you know, this isn't until October. And either the sermon series will be over by the time the 19th of October comes around, or John will have forgotten that he's doing a sermon series and it will have just fizzled out. Uh, I mean, what's the chance of neither of those things happening? <laughs> Well, I think that we're still on this sermon series, but I'm still going to preach out of First Samuel. So uh, just consider it uh, um, a dialogue with God, which is kind of the same thing as a conversation with Jesus. I need to start off with a bit of a, a caveat, and that is that, as most of you know, I uh, teach history. And so uh, I hope this doesn't sound too much like a history lesson. Uh, but I, I will warn you that it will sound a little bit like a history lesson. <laughs> but you know, of all religions, uh, I think our faith, Christianity, is the most historical. Uh, we tend to cling less to pure abstractions. And instead, we put our faith in real historical events that were witnessed by real eyewitnesses and recorded in real texts. And I think that's a, a strength, especially for me uh, as a historian. Uh, I, I really embrace that, and so I hope you will too. Uh, let's open with a moment of prayer. Heavenly Father, I just pray now that you will be with us here, that you will give us open minds and loving hearts and a receptive spirit to hear and to understand the message that you have for each one of us individually and collectively today. Uh, bless us in this uh, activity this morning, Lord, in this worship. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I would actually ask you uh, not to follow along uh, with the, uh, in the Pew Bibles, uh, because I'm going to kind of break it up, and I'm going to read a couple verses, and then talk a little bit, and then read a couple more, and uh, I want the story to kind of unfold uh, as it goes along. Uh, my text for this morning is 1 Samuel 7, uh, and I'm going to read verses 7 to 12. Uh, but I'll start off with just the first uh, couple verses. When the Philistines heard that Israel had assembled at Mizpah, the rulers of the Philistines came up to attack them. And when the Israelites heard of it, they were afraid because of the Philistines. They said to Samuel, do not stop crying out to the Lord our God for us, that he may rescue us from the hand of the Philistines. Well, that's a kind of a fragmented little chunk of a story, um, but I would like to examine this text by asking some very simple questions, maybe even questions that are so simple that we haven't really asked them. And the first question is, who are the Philistines? I don't think we ask that question very often because the Bible, the Old Testament at least, is full of stories of the Philistines. Every time you turn around, there's a, there's a Philistine. And uh, Samson is going up against the Philistines, and, and here Samuel is face to face with the Philistines, and Saul and David, uh, they're all fighting the Philistines. Well, when God promised Israel a land of their own, uh, we call it the promised land, the Bible records that God gave them victory over the nations uh, of that land. And um, those nations are listed in uh, several places in the Hebrew texts, and uh, you could probably uh, recite them uh, from memory, this list of the people that God promises he will drive out of the promised land so that Israel may take possession of it. Let me just read you one uh, occasion when Joshua, speaking for the Lord, talks to the people uh, of, uh, of Israel and tells them what the Lord is going to do. You will know that the living God is among you 
and that he will certainly drive out before you the Canaanites, Hittites and Hivites, Perizzites, Girgashites, Amorites, and Jebusites. And you know, that laundry list of people who inhabited Canaan before Israel uh, came into the Promised Land is repeated several times. Nowhere does God talk about the Philistines. So who are these people, and where did they come from? Well, um, here's the Promised Land. De Deborah, if you could put the slide up. There are two places where we uh, find out about the, uh, the kind of the definition of the promised land. One is in Numbers and the other is in Ezekiel. They vary a little bit, but essentially that is the land that God promised to the people of Israel. And it's very specific in the Bible. He tells them uh, what that land is, uh, uh, what it consists of. And as the Israelites moved into this land under the leadership of Joshua, they conquered the nations that were inhabiting this area, and a kind of power vacuum developed. And into that power vacuum, the Philistines arrived. This is around the 13th century BC. In fact, the Philistines probably pl uh, played an important part in driving out the Hittites and Hivites and Gergesites and Jebusites and all those other people. But the question still remains, who were the Philistines? Well, they were a non-Semitic people. Now, the Semites are the ancient uh, ethnic forebears of today's Arabs. And the Semites would include the Mesopotamians, the Canaanites, the Hebrews themselves were Semites, which is where our word anti-Semitic comes from, a hatred of the Jews. The Philistines probably arrived from Europe, maybe as far away as the Danube River. And they came down, and over many centuries, they migrated by sea, and they landed on the east, uh, eastern shore, the, western, uh, the eastern shore of the Mediterranean, the western uh, shore of the beaches there. Uh, in fact, the Egyptian uh, historical chronicles record the arrival of these people also, and they call them the Sea Peoples. Now, these Philistines were fierce. Uh, warriors, but they were foot soldiers. They had not developed the same kind of uh, warfare technology that everyone else had, but boy, they were fierce foot soldiers. It's interesting that both the uh, historical records of the Hebrews and the historical records of the Egyptians record that the Philistines had giants. Now, I know that, uh, you know, we're all supposed to take the Bible literally and all that kind of stuff, but when I read historical texts, I really cannot help but put on my, my skeptic hat. And so when I read the, the historical records uh, contained in the Old Testament books or contained in the Egyptian chronicles of the time, I tend to think, what is the real story behind this text? And it's interesting to me that both the Egyptians and the Hebrews said that the Philistine, that their armies contained giants. Well. Here's what I think. What I see is an Egyptian chariot commander going out with the highest technology, the latest weapon system in the ancient world. He's going out there with all of his chariots, and he's going to fight an army of foot soldiers. But they defeat him. He loses to a bunch of foot soldiers. Now he's got to go home. He's got to tell Pharaoh what happened. Well, here's, a, here's, a, here's an answer. They were giants. They were people of such colossal superhuman stature and strength, we couldn't do anything about it. We were hacking away with our, our swords and we just hit them in the knees. So they were giants. So that's kind of what I see. But the bottom line is that these people were not people you wanted to mess around with. They were fierce, disciplined, highly um, stout warriors, foot soldiers, and um, everybody who went up against them, the Hittites, the Egyptians, the Israelites had real problems. So by around the year 1200 BC, within the first couple generations after Israel settled in the Promised Land, the Philistines were a huge problem for God's people. Uh, in fact, uh, once you sl uh, flip to the next slide, uh, did you see those five white dots pop in just then? If you flip back and forth, Deborah, from the last one to this one. There you go, you see that? 
Those are the five fortified cities that the uh, Philistines built in Israelite territory. So these Philistines are showing up, these fierce warriors, and they're setting up their, their cities inside the promised land. And God never told anybody about the Philistines. What's the story? God had promised Israel a homeland. Was that promise being compromised? These new people were arriving and encroaching on God's promise? And as I read through this, I began to think, what is my promised land? What's your promised land? What is it that we feel as believers, or we hope as believers, that God has promised to us? A peaceful life? A pain-free life? Maybe healthy, nourishing relationships? Financial security? Tranquility in our old age? What is our promised land? The promises God has made to us. And the other question is, what are our Philistines? When we arrive in the promised land, and we've driven out the Hittites and the Girgashites and the Jebusites and all of those people, what are our Philistines? This new problem that pops up. The unforeseen obstacles, maybe intractable problems. An old bad habit, pride or anger or fear, some character trait that maybe is within us to keep us from realizing God's promise. Maybe there's a person in our lives that is a kind of Philistine standing in the way of God's promise. A son or daughter who won't come home. Maybe a son or daughter who won't go away. Those are problems too. <laughs> Just when we seem to have driven out the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Hivites and the Amorites, all those people, there they are, the Philistines, the giants. What is God up to? You know, a couple years ago, Sheila and I had our promised land spoiled by some Philistines. In uh, 2006, we were married and we were moving to the Puget Sound area and Sheila's daughter was uh, living in Lake Stevens, we wanted to live in the North Puget Sound area. We had our hearts set on finding a nice craftsman-style home that we could put our sweat and our money and our creative energies into. And we found that. We found that home. And we set it up. And we were happy. And then we discovered one day that our lot line was being compromised. And our neighbors had actually extended their garage onto our property. And so we approached them. We sent them copies of the survey. We asked to speak to them and maybe negotiate some kind of reasonable settlement. If they would just pay the property taxes, we'd give them the land. Well, their response was, talk to our lawyer. We ended up having to sue them at great cost to get this issue settled. And worse than the cost was the destroyed relationship. They became so bitter that our neighbors began to harass us in subtle and not so subtle ways. This home that we had built became a place where when we arrived back, we felt anxiety. I mean, you're supposed to feel safe and secure as you come back home. We felt, what have they done today every time we came home? And so in the end, in order to find peace of mind, we had to sell our home and move. And so those neighbors were the Philistines in our promised land. We felt that we were realizing God's promise, and then these giants showed up. And it's still something we don't fully understand. Well, let's see what happened to the Israelites. The Israelites have assembled at Mizpah, and um, the Philistines have come up to threaten them, and they've asked Samuel for help. So here's what happens. Then Samuel took a suckling lamb and offered it up as a whole burnt offering to the Lord. He cried out to the Lord on Israel's behalf, and the Lord answered him. While Samuel was sacrificing the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to engage Israel in battle. But that day the Lord thundered with loud thunder against the Philistines and threw them into such a panic that they were routed before the Israelites. 
the men of Israel rushed out of Mizpah and pursued the Philistines, slaughtering them along the way to a point below beth -car. So the army of Israel rushes out and they attack the Philistines. They slaughter the Philistines from Mizpah. So next slide. That little star right there shows you where Mizpah is. So they came out and uh, uh, they came out of Jerusalem and they went to the north and they engaged the uh, Philistines uh, at Mizpah uh, and they chased them. Well, where did they chase them to? Where did the Philistines go? Were they gone? Was God's promise finally realized? Let's see. Next slide. Well, there's Beth Karn, <laughs> just south of Jerusalem. So look at that. They only chase them about eight inches. <laughs> the army of Israel, even with God's help, had not succeeded in driving the Philistines out of the Promised Land. They hadn't even driven them back to their own towns. They only drove them to Beth Car. I'm pretty sure this victory did not involve driving the Philistines as far as the Israelites would have liked to have driven them. It was an incomplete, temporary, kind of half-baked victory. But isn't this the kind of victory that we sometimes experience, even with God's help? We encounter partial victories, victories uh, that are accompanied by setbacks, frustrating, temporary triumphs. Our lives often look like God's unfinished work, or maybe even unfulfilled promises. So let's see what the Israelites did after chasing the Philistines all the way to Beth Car. Let's see how they responded to that. The men of Israel rushed out of Mizpah and pursued the Philistines, slaughtering them along the way to a point below Beth Car. Then Samuel took a stone and set it up between Mizpah and Shen. He named it Ebenezer, saying, Thus far has the Lord helped us. Now keep in mind, the Philistines are still there. They haven't cleansed the Promised Land. They haven't driven the Philistines out of the Promised Land. They still occupied a huge chunk of what Israel considered to be God's promise to them. And God had not granted them anything like a complete victory. And yet, thus far has the Lord helped us. And so I think that when we look at this, we can see that wherever we are, even if it's not where we want to be, even if it's not where we think we ought to be under God's blessing, we're there. And we're there because thus far has the Lord helped us. If we truly trust God to guide us as Lord of every aspect of our lives, then we need to believe that he's leading us. We need to be in a relationship that allows us to set up our Ebenezer wherever we are. You know, there's a well-known hymn that speaks about this condition, the hymn, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. And the line in the second uh, stanza is, Here I raise my Ebenezer, Hither by thy help I've come. Now there are some altered versions of that. Uh, in the Presbyterian hymn book it says, Here I raise to thee an altar, Hither by thy help I've come. Which really doesn't make much sense at all. In the Episcopalian version it says, Here I find my greatest treasure, Hither by thy help I've come. But I hope I don't sound arrogant when I say, I think that those are just capitulations. Capitulations to a kind of biblical illiteracy. Nobody knows what an Ebenezer is, so let's just get rid of the word and stick in something else that everybody understands. But in doing so, those versions miss the point. And there is a powerful message here. Maybe we think we ought to be there, but we're here. And you know what? We're here because this is as far as the Lord has led us. I like that sentence, hither, but here I raise my Ebenezer. It's, uh, it's in the here and now. Here I raise, present tense, my Ebenezer. And you know, we're sometimes accused of being a kind of a sweet by and by uh, religion. You know, we, we discount the, the, the present 
And we think, well, you know, someday we're going to get to heaven and then we'll sing God's praises. And when we all get to heaven and, you know, someday this and someday that. And, and I like uh, a hymn that actually says, here I raise, right now I raise my Ebenezer. Perhaps like the Philistines, our bad habits, our unchristlike character traits, our physical afflictions, our relationship problems. Perhaps God has only brought these problems into remission, like the Philistines, who are still camped out inside the promised land. Maybe they'll rear their ugly heads again. But that must not keep us from remembering what the Lord has done, that he has helped us and led us thus far. You know, a couple years ago, I had my own sort of Ebenezer moment. I went with some friends up uh, Mount Baker. I was going to climb uh, to the summit of Mount Baker with a couple of buddies. And we got up to uh, the foot of the glacier at the head of uh, Heliotrope Ridge. And I was suffering wicked leg cramps. And I felt, uh, even after resting for about half an hour, I felt that I could not go on. I said, you know, if I keep going, you guys are going to be carrying me out of here. And this just isn't smart. And so I let them go on. I continued to rest for about another hour before I headed down. But right before I headed down, I suddenly felt the need to raise an Ebenezer. And this, this uh, hymn verse came into my mind. Go ahead, Deborah. And so I set up this pile of stones. You know, I wanted to be up there, but I was down here. And yet I felt hither Thus far, hither hath the Lord led us. Thus far has the Lord led me. And I, I just put up those stones and headed back down. So I've asked the band to come up and lead us in singing, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. And as we do, I ask each of you to think about your Ebenezer moment. Uh, and I hope that as we sing the second stanza of that song, that these words have new meaning for you. For thus far... Has the Lord helped us? While the band is uh, taking their places, let me just pray for a moment. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your presence in our lives each and every day. Help us to realize the moment. Help us to participate in the moment and to be with you in the moment. And to remember that wherever we are, Lord, even if we're not where we want to be, that you've led us thus far. Praise the Lord. And we would raise our Ebenezer to you, Lord. Amen. Good job.
Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and give you his peace, now and always. Amen. Amen. Amen.